Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. Today I wanted to shoot a video showing you how I process green wood for bowl blanks or hollow vessels or whatever you want to make in woodworking. If you're not already using green wood, you should. It's one of the most enjoyable things you can do in wood turning. The wood can often be had for free or just firewood prices, but you do have to know how to do it. You have to know how to process the wood successfully so it doesn't crack and you get the grain patterns that you want. So I'm going to show you how to do that with this little honey locust log here. Come on in and we'll take a closer look and I'll show you what I'm trying to do with some of the initial cuts. So here's a view of the end of this little log. Um, and if we look at it, I've already taken some slices off of it. I started processing this yesterday actually and this log was twice as long. And I think I'm probably still going to take another couple slices off the end just to see if I can get down past some of this cracking. I'm not too concerned about this crack because we're going to take this entire middle section of the log out. You've always got to remove that and we'll get to that in a later step. But there is a smaller crack here and so I'm going to take a couple slices off the very end of this log to see if I can get down past that. And here's another handy thing you can do with those slices that you've taken off the end of a log. You can lay them out on the log to kind of really quickly get a, a nice visual indication of where you should cut the log at. Because basically when you're cutting things up for bull blanks, you want to, you know, cut your uh, logettes, I guess we'll call them, you know, to be as wide as this. So another reason that I don't mind taking another couple slices off of this log is you can see that we're not going to get, you know, three of these out of here. We're going to get two of these at most, so um, there's no harm in taking, you know, another inch slice off of the end of this log to just see if we get a little further down past that cracking. So I'm going to go ahead and start the chainsaw up and do that now. So now we've got the two logettes, and you can see that we did get down past some of that cracking. There's still this little bit of cracking here that radiates out from the pith, and you're always going to have that. And again, we're going to take this completely out here in the next step. But now it's decision time. Um, we have to look at this and decide which way we're going to cut it to get a couple bowl blanks. And so I've got a straight edge and a sharpie, and we can start laying some things out. I don't always do this layout step, but I think it'll be useful for the video, and it can kind of help you visualize some different ways. So if we were to split this this way, for example, we'd wind up with two bowl blanks that are more equal in size, but the pith would be pretty off-centered on them. What I generally try to look for is the orientation that's going to best center the pith in the bowl blanks, because that's what leads to the most pleasing grain orientation. And then I let things kind of fall where they may in terms of how big the bowl blanks are. And on some logs that have a very off-center pith, that means maybe I only get one good bowl blank out of it and the other side is waste or can be cut up for spoon blanks or something like that. But I'm always after the best bowl, not the most bowls. So that's how I'm going to go ahead and lay this out. We're going to say... You know, this is more or less the orientation that we're going to cut in, so that's kind of, I missed that a little bit, but that was supposed to be right down the center. Um, and then from there, we're going to actually go ahead and cut, um, you know, about a one inch section out of the center here, just to make sure we entirely get rid of that, the pith, the very center of the tree here, what they call the pith, you know, and the first, you know, couple rings after it. 
that's always going to propagate cracking if you don't get rid of it. You can see where the crack has started there. And if we don't cut this section completely out, it's the rest of the work that we do is going to be worthless. So then I'll go ahead and, um, you know, if I were making a natural edge bowl, for example, something that looks like this, uh, we'd be ready to go with just those two cuts. I think I'm going to go ahead and make some uh, normal non-natural edge bowls here. So I'm going to go ahead and draw in another cut that I'm going to make, you know, and then this will become our bowl blank for a bowl going the other way. And then same thing over here. So before we move on from this, I should point out that another thing you can lay out here, I mean, while, while we've got the marker out, and again, this isn't something I do all the time, because you can always find it visually in other ways later, but as long as we got the marker out, I might as well take that very center of the tree, the pith here, and I can draw a line that, you know, goes out basically in a radius straight out from that, across what's going to become this bowl blank, and that'll kind of give me a center line on this bowl blank that will help me line things up later if I want to get this crane pattern perfectly balanced. And I missed that by a little bit, so I'm just going to draw another one. So that's, that's not going to be a cut. Again, that'll just be a reference mark for later, kind of help me find the absolute center grain-wise of this blank. And another thing to point out before I turn the saw back on and we get going here is I would never leave the logs in this orientation and attempt to cut down through the end grain. That's a really hard cut on both the saw and yourself. And um, really the only situation where you ever need to cut through end grain like this is if you're slabbing large logs for, you know, like slabs instead of, uh, instead of bowl blanks. What I'm gonna do instead is I'm gonna turn this bowl on its side and actually it's going to be even better to, you know, line it up with the logs like that. It holds it a little better. And then I'm going to cut down through those marks like this. Uh, making the rip cut this way is a lot easier on you and the saw than trying to rip in through the end grain. Just one more thing to point out before I make the actual cuts is that you can't always count on the pith going straight through the log and winding up, you know, exactly um, as though the grain were perpendicular to the log. On this one, it kind of does happen to, and I'm just putting this block of wood up here to kind of reference where the pith is on the other side. So this particular log actually does have nice straight grain, but you know, sometimes things will look like that where the pith is kind of over here on one side and over on the other side. So it's kind of important to take that into account on your cuts too, because um, again, what you're trying to do is get out the pith. So if this one was crooked like that, I would line up my cuts this way. Uh, on this log, we're gonna, kind of get away with them being nice and straight and since I'm going to have the side with the marks towards the camera I'm not really sure if uh, I'm going to hit them or not but I'll do my best to and, and we'll go ahead and get started on these cuts.
so you can see that what we wound up with were a couple little um, slabettes, we'll call them. And now the next step is to go in and cut out the rounds on the bandsaw. So let's head on into the workshop. All right, well now we're in the workshop. It felt good to get out of those, uh, out of all that chainsaw protective gear. It's getting pretty warm today. And you'll notice that I've got all these trash bags in the middle of the floor here. And that's where I'm putting these blanks as I process them. Um, in Colorado, it's very dry. And if I don't control the moisture loss somehow as I'm processing all these blanks, they're gonna start to crack. You might not have to do this if you live in a more humid climate. Um, for example, when I go to classes at Aeromont in Tennessee, and the southeast is a lot more humid than Colorado is, um, the time it takes to process these blanks, they, they'd be okay to sit in that climate, maybe in a pile of shavings for about a half a day or so. But in Colorado, I like to kind of keep them wrapped up, keep the ones that I'm not working on wrapped up, and that'll control, control the moisture loss. So I'm going to kind of pick through the ones that we cut this morning. So over here at the workbench, we've got this blank. This was the mark that we made earlier that shows us where the, um, where the pith, the very center of the tree was. And I went ahead and extended that mark down to where the pith is on the other side. I kind of missed the first time, so I drew a second mark. But now I've got this line that kind of shows me more or less where the pith was on this tree. And what I'm going to do next is take this uh, layout circle that I have and line the center of it up on that center line, kind of figure out how big of a blank I can get, and then I will, um, you know, once I figure that out, let's see here, it looks like, uh, looks like we're coming in on about nine inches is what we're gonna get out of this. Just move this down a little bit here, put it on that center line, kind of make sure that everything's lined up, and it is, so I'll go ahead and put that in there, make a mark for the center mark there, and I can draw this circle. And you can use a compass for this step too, uh, you know, if you don't have one of these, but these are pretty inexpensive and they're handy to have. I like doing this method because then you have a nice center point that can be used for all the rest of it and the circle's laid out, so we're ready to head over to the bandsaw. Now we're back over here at the workbench and I wanted to talk about some possibilities for getting this bowl started on the lathe. Um, this one is just 9 by 3 so it's small enough that uh, you know me personally I, I would likely start this in between centers just because it's on the smaller side. Um, I would not want to use either of these two types of centers. This is uh, one of the step centers and this is the one-way safe driver. I love these for spindle work but they're not going to give you a very good bite here on a piece of green wood. Um, a better center for these greenwood bowl blanks is like the four prong drive that came with your lathe or uh, even better than that is a slightly heavier duty version of the four prong drive or the best yet is a two prong drive center and the idea being that these two prongs can align with the grain here and kind of go in there you know they'll go in along the grain and this will give you a much more positive hold. Uh, you will have to use this sort of thing when you're doing a natural edge bowl and we'll go over that in a future video. Um, but what I'm going to do with this bowl and the safest way to do this and I'm going to you know since this video is oriented to beginners I'm going to go ahead and use the faceplate that came with my lathe and a little trick that I have for centering a faceplate is you can take a Forstner bit where um, the diameter is as close as you can get and it's still able to slide back out the other side of the faceplate. Uh, you can put the point in there in the point from your compass 
go ahead and slide the faceplate down over that and that will get that relatively centered and ready to go. Uh, final point about faceplates is you never want to use screws like these, these kind of common, you know, wood screws from the hardware store, these little gold, gold screws. These are not suitable for holding a faceplate at all. They just don't have the uh, strength to withstand the shearing forces. What you want to use are either sheet metal screws or my personal favorite are these SPAC screws. And I have a couple different styles here. Um, this one has kind of the tapered shank on it, which you match the style of screw to your faceplate, and this doesn't really match this style. For this style of faceplate, we want this other box of the SPAC screws here that have the flat head on it, and that'll go in and give us a nice secure hold on this blank. Now we're over here at the lathe and it's almost time for the fun part. Um, one more thing I like to do is when there's bark on a blank like there is on this one, go ahead and use your locking mechanism to lock the um, headstock and then you can take a skew chisel or something similar and just see if you can pry that bark off just to kind of see if it's loose. And I'm not going not gonna to totally go after it, but if it, if it is able to pry off relatively easily, I'd rather that it come off now than when I start turning. This is actually on pretty good, so I'm not going to worry about, you know, taking every last bit of that off, but let's kind of maybe get the big chunks off, and then I'll rotate it around and do that on the other side, too. So I'm going to have a break in the action here to talk about a couple things. Um, first is, when you're turning greenwood, you're in a race against time. And you can see already here where I've got a little crack propagating there. That was probably because, um, you know, that probably originated from the pith, and I probably didn't quite take as much off of, out of the center of this log as I should have. So I'm going to have to go ahead and make this bowl about that much shorter, or take a couple more passes here to get down past that crack. And the next thing I'm going to do, you can see that I put the tailstock back on. I'm going to go ahead and, while this is spinning, advance the tailstock into the piece to go ahead and give myself a center marker. This is something I often forget to do when I'm uh, starting on a faceplate because you don't really need the tailstock for a faceplate. But if you, if you advance that center point into the spinning workpiece, it's going to give you a useful reference to recenter this blank later. So I'm going to go ahead and do that.
and I'm getting ready to turn around the bowl and do the outside now and you can see here this little step is about how far down I had to cut to get rid of that crack that I showed you earlier that was propagating somewhere around here. So that crack's gone and we're good to go on hollowing out the inside. Well, this little bowl is all done for this stage of the turning process. It's ready to dry, and after it has slowly air dried, hopefully without cracking, we'll turn it again down to final thickness in a few months here. Um, just to go over some of the finer points here, uh, you saw me go like this a lot during the turning, and that's because I was checking for a consistent wall thickness. That will um, influence how successful you are um, with drying these. So I'm going to go ahead and take this out and we can discuss some uh, different drying methods. So now that this bowl's been rough turned, we've got uh, to decide on a drying method that will allow it to dry slowly and gently without cracking. And what drying method works for you is going to depend a lot on your climate. Um, either way, I'm going to first go ahead and write the date on here. It's May 16th. This was honey locust, and sometimes I'll add a little note about where I got it from. I'll say Downing Street on this one. So I've got a little record of when it was turned and what it is. And then, like I said, from here you have to choose a drying method. Um, I've heard of people in more humid climates than Colorado using the paper bag and shavings method, where we take some of the fresh shavings, that are still nice and moist from the turning. You can put those in a bag, put the bowl in there, and put a few more shavings in there on top of it. And then you can take them, you know, either tape or staple this paper bag shut, you know, and let this dry for anywhere from, you know, four to six months, kind of, again, depending on your climate. The general rule for air drying is that it takes one year per inch of thickness. And I'll tell you that here in Colorado, we get away with drying things a lot quicker than that. Um, but one thing that we can't get away with here in Colorado is the paper bag and shavings method. If I tried this in Colorado, this bowl would be, you know, cracked and worthless within a week. So, uh, what I have to do in Colorado that results in even slower drying than the paper bag and shavings is I use a product called Greenwood In Sealer. This is Rockler's house brand. Um, the original one is called Anchor Seal. Craft Supplies has one. And all it is is just a wax emulsion. And you, you go ahead and you just put a pretty liberal amount on here. This is not the time to try to save money. Uh, just, you know, go ahead and slop a lot of this on. Obviously I'm doing this on this piece of cardboard so I don't get it on my garage floor because it is a it is a wax emulsion and it's, it, it'll create a slick spot on the floor and be hard to get up if, uh, if you do get it all over the place. But yeah, I just slop a lot on like that. Um, turn this over and put a little bit more on.
And if you have a little sticker like this, you can go ahead and put that down there so the bowl has something to kind of rest on. Um, and actually the package directions for this say that you want this to kind of uh, uh, get a little bit tacky, so you let it dry for about five or ten minutes, and then you put a second equally thick coat of this on. But um, anyway, that's uh, the basics about the initial process for working with Greenwood. Hope you found the video helpful, and if you did, please go ahead and hit that like and subscribe button. And we'll see you next time.